Geronimo. When you woke up this morning, did you purposely say, I'm going to confine myself to a box? Or do you just avoid putting any conscious thought into today? When you're busy going at it, literally or figuratively, do you ever find yourself pausing for a moment to realize what's going on? Or are you just reacting? When you hear the saying, may I have your attention, please, do you continue as you were? Or do you consider the information you're about to receive might actually be valuable? When I was growing up, my mother used to ask me to do things. And sometimes her reasoning was, because I said so. Looking back, I wish perhaps I took the time to pause, think, and consider the ramifications of my choices. Good Tuesday to you. Today is October 11, 2016. This is episode number 22 of Pause, Think, Consider. Thank you for everyone tuning in today to listen. As a little special thing, instead of passing on via Facebook or going on to our website or liking, the request that we'll be making for today is to go tell someone you know, potentially that you haven't talked to in a while, that you love them. The topic for today is relaxing and how to relax. Today's episode, a special guest will be joining us. It's a special environment traveling in Sacramento for a little day trip to actually take part in some relaxation. But before we get into that, before we hear from our special guest, I want to start with all the different and potential ways of being able to relax. I think it really comes down to three different potential things. First is physical. Second being mental. And the third being emotional. There's ways to relax in all three. They they essentially work together. And so when you're able to relax physically, in theory, you should be able to mentally and emotionally relax as well. But I think there's primary objectives that we have. And we do certain things to make us relax for one specific thing. I don't know that we necessarily go through and we have a specific... We, we go on vacation, as an example. I don't know when we go on vacation that we're specifically saying, oh, I'm going to relax physically and emotionally and mentally. I think it's really for for one or maybe two of those. We could say it's for all three, but I think it has a primary objective. So an example of physical relaxation could be getting a massage. It could be spending the day on the couch. Depending upon your work, maybe your physical labor construction, physical relaxation would be at a high point for you. It would be something that you would be seeking potentially more than mental or emotional. Not that those things can't affect you in a physical job, but more than likely the thing that's going to affect your psyche is the fact that each and every day you're using your body and needing to find ways to get it to calm down, stop 
have your feet stop screaming at you, your back stop pinching, your neck stop radiating, and just relax. The second form of relaxation is mentally. We've talked several times on this program about being all in, investing yourself completely in our all or nothing mentalities. And that can be very emotionally draining. A great example being stress at work. And I've got a good friend of mine, very high paying job, very status driven position, a VP of the company, and emotionally for this individual, they love for vacation for them, it is so that they're able to check out. They're able to emotionally detach themselves from the daily grind that they go through, all the stress that they have. Now, I think in the case of emotional, I think it's in the case of, of any of these relaxation ways or techniques, is if your emotions are getting to you, eventually you start to have physical ailments. Then you start to have mental ailments that you have to overcome. That's where they're all interconnected. Third and final relaxation, physical, emotional, mental. Being able to mentally detach yourself. Very similar to emotionally detaching yourself, but mentally being able to turn off. That whole idea, the example I gave in the previous episode of unplugging from a vacation, finally having that ability to unplug. And so mentally, really, it's not in the sense of mentally not doing anything, but maybe being more mentally focused on something that you enjoy. Instead of being mentally focused on your patience, you're now mentally focused on your physical fitness. So you might go for a yoga retreat. That's a great way for you to relax mentally. And I have my own personal techniques, but I first want to pass it off to our guest for today. And our guest, we've talked about her on several occasions. She's known as not only the girlfriend, the P3B girl, or otherwise known as Jean, but Jean is unique in the sense, and I don't want to steal her thunder, but she is unique in the sense that we're very different when it comes to relaxation. That's why I think her viewpoint is really unique and really valuable because everybody is different. Everybody has a different sheet of music. Certain things that relax myself potentially are an irritant for Jean, and it comes a lot with her background, which Jean will share about, but it comes with a lot of the background, the nature of her job, and just that ability to relax and unwind can be very challenging. So without further ado, here is the lovely Jean. Well, first I have to say that was very interesting hearing you do your, your intro. I felt like I was meeting a celebrity or something. I spent so much time listening. It was like, oh, wow, I can see it live happening right in front of me. I was uh, so hypnotized. What was I supposed to, what was the question? What am I, what exact aspect am I talking about here? 
How about we start with the aspect of your, not necessarily inability to unwind, but what it is. And specifically, I know there's a statistic out there that with military-based individuals, they have a much more challenging, much more difficult ability to unwind. And I know a lot of that is the aspect of, of the struggles that you go through. So can you, can you talk about that aspect of bringing your work home and, and preventing you from having the ability to relax and unwind? All right, so even way back before I joined the military, I had a, a rather difficult time relaxing. I'm an A-type personality. I tend to think too much. You know, as an A-type personality, people who are this way know you're always analyzing something. You're a bit of a perfectionist. Going to sleep, you analyze your day and count the things you did wrong. It's like counting sheep. You just count the things you did wrong and eventually you go to sleep. Um, but what was interesting for me in the military, and I didn't really notice it happening for quite a while, was that you learn that you never really go home. A lot of people, you go to your job, and then you go home, and then you're there. You can unplug, you can turn the phone off, things like that. Um, you always kind of know that you can quit. You can quit your job, or you can leave. Um, it's made pretty clear to you in the beginning when you join that you're basically signing away a lot of your rights as a average American citizen. I mean, we have a completely different judicial system. Uh, there's things that the military can punish you for that civilian courts can't, uh, such as appearing to break a law. There's actually a rule in the military that you cannot appear to break a law. It doesn't matter if you do or not, but if you do an action which looks like you're breaking a law, well, then you're in um, same thing with things like adultery. You can get persecuted, um, you can lose your job over adultery in the military. So there's a lot of these aspects in which the military is in your personal life. They're into your health, they're into your finances, they want to know every little thing that you're doing. And all of that goes back into how you're evaluated and how you're perceived and your job opportunities at work. Um, and the other thing is that you never really know what you're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. You never really know when you're going to need to work. Like, you have an idea. You have a schedule. Uh, but any time you can be called back. Uh, any time I see an area code on my phone that's 916, I, I think it's work. Everybody has this reaction when they hear their phone ring and they see a number they don't know. I think it's someone from work. You call it, you're called in, you were supposed to be in, and you're not. You were supposed to be flying, you're supposed to be A, B, or C. Um, going on vacation is stressful because you never really know if you're going to be able to go until you're there. And even when you're there, you're wondering if you did something wrong and you're going to get in trouble because you were supposed to be at work or they're going to call you back and you're going to have to ruin all these plans. Our little vacation today actually almost came into question because I was told that I wasn't going to have to work today. And then I was told last minute that I was working today and I was able to get a friend to come for me. So that was fun. Um, so there, there's that aspect. I never really realized how stressful that was until... I was at a crisis incident stress team management course. These are the, the kumbaya people of the Coast Guard. They go around after stressful events and they talk to people of a, a military mindset. Military tends to attract a certain type of person, a first responder personality. And they talk to them and they talk to them about how they can be dealing with this stress, how they can cope with it. But they also just talk about like basic problems that coasties or marines or whoever may be having because of their job. And one of the things that they said, which stuck to me, was that the average military member needs two full weeks, two full weeks of being completely disconnected from their job to begin to relax and to feel rejuvenated. And I wondered about that. I really wondered about that. 
And I had the opportunity a couple weeks later to go to a class that was, of course, job related. But in this class, it was, it was just academic. I was doing no maintenance work. I was doing no search and rescue work. Nobody was going to die if I did my job wrong. I wasn't standing duty. I mean, my station called me for the first week. Uh, they called me about the parts that were ordered. They called me about maintenance they did. They called me about uh, where I had put different kits and things like that. But after the first week, these calls died off because realistically speaking, I'm not going to remember uh, or have caused a problem that was now happening or know the solution to a problem that was now happening because I was being gone for five weeks. So after the first week, these calls died off. I didn't have to worry about standing duty, about coming in at an inconsistent schedule or spending the night at the station or responding to search and rescue calls or hot law enforcement calls or anything like that. And it was a lot of work. It was long days, uh, like 100 pages of reading a night, tests, uh, homework assignments, all that kind of thing. And it was really stressful for a lot of people. And I remember Jesse specifically talking to me and being like, you know, you're really stressed out about this. How can I help you de-stress about this? And I went, you know, I'm actually not really stressed at all. I was like, I'm talking about these things and I'm worried about them. I was like, but no one's going to die. If, if I fail this, they're going to find a way to push me through or whatever. I might not accomplish my goals, but that's on me. The only person I'm going to screw over is myself. I'm not getting calls in the middle of the day or at night. I'm not worried about, I didn't read the schedule correctly and I'm not showing up to work on time or someone did the schedule and expected me to call the flight recorder and I didn't and therefore, I, you know, none of this happened. I knew exactly when I was going to work. I knew exactly what I was going to be done with work. I had the schedule of my homework for the whole week. Um, <clears throat> and nobody was going to die or was at risk or anything. And it was so relaxing. It was so freeing. And I thought back to this course that I took that said you need two full weeks to relax. And I realized, wow, I had been living my life for the past over four years now constantly waiting for that call or that text or you know any minute you're relaxing you know that just any minute something's going to happen and you might have to go away and you did something wrong and you're like, constantly thinking about that what did i do today could i have left anything on the plane could i have made a you know could i have not shut a door could i do a pre-flight wrong did this ding i saw on the propeller was it really that bad was it was it worse than i thought did the plane you know there's so many things that run through your mind i didn't have to think about any of that it was uh it was pretty amazing so going through that experience made me realize how important it was for first responders or even people who have one of those jobs that is constantly on you, um, you know, on all hours of the day, things like that. It's just that challenge of finding how to how to turn that out, and how to relax. Which makes it even that much more interesting, Gene. How today, really. I mean, is it safe to say that you were able to relax despite it only being a couple hours? I mean, I was still worried about my, my drop flight tomorrow, but there were quite a few 15-minute gaps where I didn't think about that, so I would quantify that as pretty relaxed for me. Yeah, I would quantify that as being pretty <laughs> relaxed for you as well. I think the key in that, and... What we actually did, we took a day trip to, it's pronounced the, the Vicky Springs? I think it's Vichy. Vichy Springs. So, or maybe it's French. It's French probably, so Vichy. <laughs> yeah, that, that probably makes even that much more sense. I'll link to it on the website. Great. It's out in, what's the name of the town again? Ukiah. Ukiah. Ukiah, California. So from Sacramento, it's about a two and a half, three hour drive heading north, and then heading towards the coast. And these springs that they have, it's basically like a mineral bath. And I've done a mineral bath. There's another place out in Oregon that my parents have done called Kanita, the Kanita, like, Indian Reservation. 
where they have these mineral springs. But the unique thing about the Vichy Springs, that there's only two other places in the entire world that have these. They call it the Champagne Bath. And I didn't completely understand what it meant until we actually got into them. But it's a complete gravity-based... Who was the individual that they said in, like, 1908 went to these things? Oh, I don't, I don't remember. Somebody famous. I recognize the name. Yeah, it might have been, like, Lewis and Clark or, or something of that nature. That type of an individual went to these things. So it's been around for at least a century. It was, the bats, I think, were formed in uh, 1860. Okay. So 1860. So there have been people that have been going to the Vichy Springs for a long time. And the great thing about it, and again, I've done mineral baths before. Gina, have you done a mineral bath before? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. So first time doing a mineral bath. The unique thing about this spring and specifically the champagne bath, is it's all gravity-driven. So when you start to fill the tub up or run the water out, it's all based on gravity. And it's, and it's a naturally occurring. They don't have any mineral. There's a couple, depending on what pool you go into, they add some natural minerals to it. But the champagne bath, is one that you get into it, and it feels like a normal bath water. And then you lay in this thing, and eventually, you it almost feels like somebody's doing acupuncture on you, or tickling you. And you can feel these bubbles, and you see the bubbles that go all around yourself. And... There's something about just being in the tub of water out in the wilderness with the sky above you that, and you have no other responsibilities. For me personally, I find that extremely relaxing. I love one of my favorite places personally to go to is Bend, Oregon. If you've never had the opportunity to go there, I've been going there since, gosh, I was six years old. And for me, the thing that has always been so relaxing about it is you have no timeline. Now, granted, today could have done an all-day pass, but we did two hours. And I'm glad that we only did two hours because I personally could have done an, an extra hour. Gene, what about you? Could you have done an extra hour? I was getting a little fidgety there towards the end, so that was about the right timeline for me. Okay, so that's interesting. Again, she shared, Jean shared her story about the nature of her job and getting fidgety. Yet, I could have done it an extra hour. So, Jean, maybe because for me, if there was one thing that I was going to go do, one thing particularly, if I knew I had to go de-stress on wine, aside from going back to those springs, which was amazing, it was just two hours. The, the, the round trip is going to be six hours of driving. Left about nine, ten o'clock in the morning to head out there. And we're going to get back basically. So it's a 12 hour day. All is said and done. Yeah, we had dinner in there and lunch. At a Buddhist temple. At a Buddhist temple. But the Buddhist temple wasn't exactly the relaxing part. It was these springs. But if there was one thing in particular, I would go to bed. And I would have no plan whatsoever. No defined plan. I would wake up. I would eat breakfast. I would probably go play some pickleball. I'd come back. I'd eat lunch. Probably go to the pool read for an hour or two, go to dinner, go grab some gelato at Bonta. I think that's how it's pronounced, B-O-N-T-A. I'll link to them. Amazing. Amazing gelato out in the Bend area. 
And I would repeat that till I felt great. And it would probably take at least a week. Two weeks for me of doing that, I'd be like putty on a massage table. And I would have no problem going back to being reacclimated to the world and feeling completely at peace physically, mentally, and emotionally. But Gene, I know it's a complete different story for you. So maybe give an example of if you're going to relax, you're, you're trying to get to the same comatose state that I'm at of being putty on the massage table. What for you is going to get you there? Well, first off, I did want to mention that the cool thing about the Vichy Springs wasn't just the bubbles and the nature, but it was that the baths are 91 degrees. But when you go in them and the bubbles form, I forget the chemical that's actually in the bubbles, but um, it increases the, uh, the width of your capillaries. So they said that you start to feel warm. You're actually not being warmer. Your blood circulation is just increasing, which is why they're supposed to have such healing properties. But a great motivational factor for being relaxed in those springs is that if you move around, the bubbles don't stay on you and you are cold. However, if you lie perfectly motionless, you feel warm. So it's kind of motivation to not be fidgety or, or move around. And you know that it's supposed to be healing, so it's actually productive. Um, in regards to what you said about relaxing, that See, that, that, those, that description of what you're talking about just makes me stressed out just listening to it. Uh, that concept of having that much time without have, having anything to do is, is uh, stressful. I uh, would love to go somewhere and have some sort of event, like train for some sort of marathon or triathlon or mud run or whatever, um, and then, you know, get completely physically exhausted have some really, really big meal, uh, go to bed or wake up in the morning, like kind of get a massage or whatever, have that nice feeling after you completely exhaust yourself where you're just like super heavy, you don't want to move at all and kind of lays around for a bit and then probably do a project or whatever. Um, and I'm really into like the cooking and the blogging thing right now, so I would love to take a cooking class or start or write a couple of blog posts or have a big stack of, of library books on my newest thing to study or um, go volunteer somewhere like build a, a house for Habitat for Humanity or something. Just get away, do something productive to feel good about myself, physically tired, um, eat food. Gelato is, that was an unstressful part about what you were talking about. Um, and then, you know, something rewarding after that, like a, like a massage or a hot springs bath or something like that to try to just physically relax would be nice. So that's interesting because it's, it's not quite a polar opposite, but it's very different because I'm able to physically detach myself. I'm able to go head into relaxation. Take the state that I currently am in and just go right into relaxation versus what it sounds like you're describing from a relaxation standpoint is you need to actually completely deplete yourself mentally, emotionally, physically, and as a result of that, you're then able to relax. Is that true? That would probably be, be pretty accurate. I mean, then you feel accomplished and you feel good about yourself and, uh, you know, you, you really deserve your break. Yeah, that makes sense. So, in order to try and help other individuals, because everybody's different. We all have our own sheet of music that we play by. Obviously, we've been able to collectively, as a team, find ways, even though we're very different. We have different jobs. We have different emotional and mental stressors. We have different things that allow us to relax. And yet, 
we've been able to collaborate in a fashion that has allowed both of us to relax, both of us to de-stress. Now, am I less stressed right now than you are? Probably, but... It's not always going to, it, there's got to be a little bit of a give and take. But yet, we still were able to achieve, it wasn't all or nothing. Even though that's very much how I think both of us operate, very all or nothing, going balls to the walls, if we're going to use a figure, a figurative way of speech. But... What would be some ways that other individuals can ensure if, if they are with somebody that's different or their child or their grandparents or their mother? Because I know you and your mother, very different individuals. Things for your mom that help her relax very different from what helps you relax. So what would be some some tips or tricks for dealing with individuals that are different than yourself and being able to find that common in, enjoyment and, and de-stress? I would say to, to find the intersection. I mean, you woke up and you flew here this morning um, after not getting a lot of sleep and spending the night with your friends, I spent all last night by myself. I got to bed as early as possible, woke up, did a really hard workout, and then um, came back, and I've just been outrageously productive for the two days. So I was already in the mode where I'm ready to, to eat and just collapse somewhere, and lo and behold, that's exactly what you wanted to do. You know, so I mean, I know better than to get all hyped up and you come see me and I go, hey, let's go for a 10 mile run. I mean, sometimes that works, but not usually. So I, I would say, you know, find the intersection. There's probably some point at which you two want to do the same thing. And you can plan that so that they intersect at the right time. Yeah, I think that's great advice. So. If we're going to try and turn this into a, a three-step program, so we try and give tangible, personal viewpoints and advice. So number one would be find a common ground. So I'll give number two, and you can follow it up with number three. So number two, if we're going to be collaborative on this. So first one being find a common ground. Second one being... Find something, doesn't necessarily matter what it is, but find something that you personally can find enjoyment in. I know that sounds fairly selfish, but I think if you're with somebody, whether it's a family member, a significant other, a friend, a colleague, but I think it's it's almost as if like a law of attraction that if it's something that I enjoy, and I know speaking from personal experience between both of us, if there's something that you enjoy, I might not completely enjoy it. Like I know you're a huge fan of My Little Pony. My Little Pony, the original, completely different story. My Little Pony. Friendship is magic. Friendship is magic. Not my favorite. Not my favorite. Yet, I know how much you enjoy it. And as a result watch an of watching an episode with you, because I love you, I actually get enjoyment out of it myself. And it happens very often. 
And it's one of those things that I know so often you talk about that, oh my gosh, look, oh my gosh, Jesse, look, you, you like it too. He really likes it, everybody. He likes it. And it's the same thing for myself, that when I am stupid passionate about something, whether it's this podcast or playing pickleball, or whatever it is. I remember the first time we went and we played pickleball together. Again, you'd never played before. Ever. It was the first time you ever played. And we went on a freaking 40-mile bike ride one way or whatever the hell it was. I think it was, it was at least, no, it was over 14, like 23? Yeah. So 23 one way to go play pickleball in the morning. I was stupid fired up about it. We left at 6.30 on a Saturday morning. Yeah, not ideal probably for you. For me, that runs on smoke coming out of both his ears. Not a problem. So, that was not ideal. But, as a result of me being so fired up about this, you trying it, is it safe to say that even though, maybe initially, like when you look at the game Pickleball, before you ever knew about it, not really interested in not not something not at the top of your list of things to go try. It may was not. Yeah, not your top of the list. But because of me being passionate about it, of it being something that I was excited about, it made you more excited to try. It. Yeah, and I think my favorite part was watching you run around the court with a bunch of old people laughing your head off. Right. Not necessarily getting into any details, but that physical enjoyment of seeing other people finding enjoyment. And there are some selfish freaking pricks out there that it almost seems like they get enjoyment out of watching other people not find enjoyment. And I think those individuals tend to be very highly stressed individuals. They have a lot of turmoil going on in their lives. And I don't think it's relaxing for them or for anyone within their circle. So if we're going to be specific, you've got to find that common ground, like you talked about, Gene, and then find something that you personally are passionate. And if you are passionate, people will follow. As we talked about in the previous episode of passion. You find that thing that you're passionate about, you're able to go and do it. I'm really passionate about going to Bend. I know even though, despite the fact that you need something, a, a plan, you need to completely deplete all of your resources, that while you might start twitching a little bit, because I am so passionate about Bend and the relaxation process that occurs, it is naturally going to help you relax. Now, in order to go the full way, we're going to have to make some amendments. We're going to have to tweak a few things here or there in order to help you completely relax. But just the fact that we've found common ground and we've found something that one of us is passionate about is enough to allow you to relax. So for the third and final point, Jean, please bring it home. I would say have a time goal, a time you set aside. Like I estimate we're going to need two to three hours to this or a day to do this but at the end of it don't make it rigid don't stick to that hardcore I think a lot of the times when I have I mean the gym is kind of my happy place and one of the most relaxing things I can say to myself there is you have this routine and it's going to take you as long as it takes you and that to me is just like a whoop you know is one of the most relaxing things to say you know what you're going to get these things done and it's going to take you as long as it's going to take you, and that's okay. And I think that's something important to do when you're out with a friend relaxing or, I mean, whether it's you're having a nice dinner or you're getting a 
massage or going to hot springs or whatever, have a, a, a time goal that's reasonable, you know, but give it some wiggle room so you can be like, you know what, so we're running an hour or two hours late. And you know that's okay. Like, we're going to get this done. It's going to take us as long as we're going to take us. And if we're still having a good conversation, it's fine. I think that's something that's really important if you're actually going to go out and relax. It's just So that way you're not worried about watching the clock. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I know for myself personally, this has been a challenge. But as a result of being adaptable and learning to let go because I am such a so stringent on time management even though I'm being using some truth serum and being completely transparent with myself I am not the best with my time management I could be much more efficient in several areas of my life however the idea that we're just going to go to X place and have no timeline the initial reaction is of paranoia. Oh my God. When is this going to end? Where are we going to go? There's no definition to it. And yet, after that initial fear, taking that leap of faith, it allows you to begin that relax relaxation process. So in recap, we've talked about relaxation. Now there's really three different types. They're all interchangeable. They're all interconnected. But there's physical, emotional, and mental relaxation. Both Gene and I shared what allows us to relax. For me personally, it's going to bend and I'm able to dive right into relaxation. For Jean, she needs to actually deplete herself of her resources before she's able to actually relax. Great example, going to the gym and doing a three-hour workout is then allows her to relax. And then as a collective tag-teaming duo, we were able to come up with three steps to help you relax. The first one being find that common ground. Gene and I are very different individuals, philosophically, emotionally, even physically different, and yet we're able to find that common ground, that give and take, not all or, or nothing. Then from there, finding something that you personally enjoy, whether whether it's you or that other individual, because that passion you're able to feed into. It's something that allows you to be able to start the relaxation process. And then the third and final way for beginning that relaxation process is, Jean? Is setting some sort of time frame, but letting it be loose, letting there be some wiggle room so that you're not so worried about watching the clock. I want to thank you all for listening in today during this very different, very fly by the sea of her pants episode bring in special guest Jean Dahlquist. Thank you, Jeannie, for stopping by. Thank you, Jesse. And I look forward to talking to you all again tomorrow on Pause, Think, Consider.